how to live a life that wins, adapted from the book by the great man of God called Watchman Nee, a Christian pastor who was in prison for 20 years for his faith. And he wrote this book, The Life That Wins is part of our foundation and discipleship program. We are progressing now to chapter 3 and 4. Chapter 3 and 4 talks about the nature of the life that wins and how to enter into that life. Okay, I trust you have been following. If you have not, get hold of the tape, chapter 1 and chapter 2. Chapter 1 talks about all oh, the, 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 the gross eight categories of sins of men. Okay, we talk about the sins of the spirit, the sins of the flesh, the sins of the mind, the sins of the disposition, the sins of not wanting to obey God, dishonoring God and not honoring Him in our life. Sins of commission and sins of omission. You know what is right, but you don't do it. The Bible calls it a sin. Of course, you know what is wrong, but you went ahead and do it. You lack the power to say no to sin. And so watch many describes that this is our dilemma. This is what man experiences. And we know sin is a terrible slave master. Yes or no? Slave, sin is a terrible slave master. It, it, it causes you to, to, to pay a great price. Sin is pleasurable for a moment. The Bible says it's pleasurable. Don't tell your friend don't sin, you know. Because they enjoy it. Sin is pleasurable. But tell them it's for a moment. And after that, the devil comes to collect his price. Yes? And so we know... Uh, we live in this world where there is this issue of sins of man and bondages and addiction and nobody has to tell a gambler his habit is wrong. He just can't help it. Nobody has to tell a womanizer that what he does is wrong. He can destroy his marriage and his children and his trust of his children. He can't help it. Yes or no? Nobody have to tell somebody who commit theft, who stole money from his company. It's wrong, but he can't help it. The temptation is too great. So we are facing with an issue in life, in humanity. There is the power of sin that destroys mankind. And the problems in the world today, you see, is because of the sins of man, the greed of man, the selfishness of man, the self-centeredness of man. Every quarrel, every, every uh, uh, dispute, every legal battle in court is always because of some selfishness and self-centeredness of man. Yes? And so, watch many in his book, he described these scenes and he described, no, but God wants to give us a kind of life that is victorious, that is wonderful. And you know, you sing the song, he came from heaven to earth. For what purpose? To show us the way. And then from earth to the cross, my debt to pay. And from the grave, from the cross to the grave, and from the grave to the sky, to give us a new resurrected life. Hallelujah. So the, the kind of life the Bible described for a Christian is this. It's a life that is free from sin. A life that is free from the power of sin. You have the power to say no to sin if you don't want to. Your friends that are not born again have no power. They can't help it. They say, the devil make me do it. Pastor, ask him, why do you do it? Say, I can't help it. The devil. Poor devil get blamed. The devil makes me do it. But, the life of a Christian, the Bible describes, is a kind of life where you have power over sin and live a life free from sin. And a life of uninterrupted communion with God. You have the communion with God, a life of peace, a life of restfulness, not anxiety. A life of hope and satisfaction. A life that is satisfied. Today, the world is a hungry world. Not just the physical world, but you look at the people around you. People are not satisfied. Whether it is in business, whether it is in 
uh, in the home, whether it is in marriage, people are not satisfied. There is a hunger. And the life that wins is a life that is uh, never thirst. Jesus says, if you come to me, I will satisfy you. You will never hunger and thirst. But today, many Christians are still thirsty. They still want to enjoy the entertainment of the world. I talked to you about Hollywood. Hollywood still is a multi-billion dollar industry. Why? Because people are hungry. And I say all celebrities are overrated. They are overrated because they produce movies and, they make, and you watch and watch movie after movie, but still you are not satisfied. There is a demand for entertainment. Why is there a demand for entertainment, for television and, and, and movies? Because man's heart is looking for something that will satisfy them. But after watching that movie, they come out, they are still not satisfied. They wait for the next one. When is the one coming soon? Yes or no? So we are living in that place uh, where there is dissatisfaction. People's needs are unsatisfied. But Jesus says, if you come to me, you will never hunger and thirst. A life of uninterrupted communion, a life of satisfaction, a life of restfulness. And so he compares what the Bible says about us, the, life, the kind of life we can have and what we are living. Even though you are born again, so-called born again. Even though you come to church, you have not discovered that secret. So chapter 3 and 4 talks about the nature of this life, the kind of life that wins and how to enter into it. Let me just now begin to show you. Number one, the nature of life that wins, that can have this satisfaction, that can have a complete control over your temper and your bad habits that you can love others and put yourself second and others first. We know that we should love one another, but we say, Lord, it's very hard. Once in a while, we, we blow up. Our fuse blow up. You lose your temper. And you say, oh, it shouldn't happen to me, but I don't know why it happened. And for 20, 30 years after as a Christian, you find you cannot have this victory and success to live the kind of life that wins, that this man of God talked about. He was able to have that kind of life. And Apostle Paul was able to have that kind of life. Number one, we must understand, he says, the kind of life that wins has got nothing to do with you. It has got nothing to do with you. It's not based on how hard you try. It's not based on your willpower. It's not based on your pursuit of education, your pursuit of uh, uh, endeavor, and you try and you struggle, and you try to have that kind of life that wins. Aren't you glad? The life that wins, that God gave us, He came from heaven to earth, to earth, to show you the way. The kind of life has got, number one, nothing to do with you. Let's look at the scripture he shared this scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. Not a very common verse of scripture. Where God was saying in the Old Testament, and also the strength. Some version translate this as victory. How to have victory in a life that wins. Some Bible version translate this as glory. The strength of Israel or the victory of Israel the glory of Israel will not lie nor repent. For he is not a man that he should repent. 1 Samuel 15 verse 29. So what is victory? We all want victory in our life. We want to be victorious over our temper. We want to be victorious over our self-centeredness. We want to be Christ-centeredness and not self-centeredness. Yes or no? You have been taught in the Bible. You want to be a loving person. You want to be a person who is uh, 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 be able to be like Jesus. But let's deal with the more relevant areas that people struggle. Our pride, 
our temper, our bad habits or addiction. Do you know that some people have been Christians and they find that, wow, for a moment they are very happy, they are transformed, they experience change. But as they live longer, they find out that some of those sins in their lives or habits continue to follow them. And they don't seem to be able to shake them. And one common one is our temper, uncontrollable temper or bodily appetites. Some, some addictions of the flesh. So the scripture says for the strength or the victory of Israel does not repent nor does not lie nor repent. So what is this victory? For he is not a man that he should relent. In other words, should change his mind. So victory is not an experience. My next slide. According to this verse, victory is not just an experience or an event you experience in your life. When we talk about having victory, the scripture declares victory is in a person. Because that verse says, he is not a man that he should repent or lie. For the victory of Israel. So this verse of scripture describes that Israel, the nation of old, will have victory, not because of their own military might or capability or their wisdom. It's not an experience, but victory is found in a person. And we know that person is Jesus Christ. Say amen. And so if you want victory this morning in your life, how to live a successful Christian life, and how to have balance between work and ministry, victory is not by struggle. Victory is not by you trying harder, by your endeavor, but victory is found in a person. Victory is a person. Say amen. His name is Jesus. If you want control over your temper, if you want control over bodily appetites, or addiction, if you want your life to be changed, you want to live a fruitful life, it's not by your own knowledge and struggle. It's found in a person. Okay, let's look at the next slide. Victory is not an experience. We think victory is something we enter. Victory is something we get. A victory, we think, is a state of mind where you conquer a bad habit. Yes, uh, it's something that you have to do, but it's not. According to the teaching in the Bible, the life that wins, this man of God, he's saying, victory is found in a person. He's called the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the foundation we are laying. Now, let's look at the scripture, and you will know what I mean. A very famous verse of scripture, Galatians 2 verse 20. Apostle Paul has come to that stage in his life. He has experienced this and he is living it. I know we know this scripture, we can quote it, but let me just teach it a little bit more this morning. Apostle Paul has reached that level in his life. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. There are four things in this verse. Number one, I have been crucified with Christ. Yes, number two, it's no longer I who live. Then number three, he says, but Christ that lives in me. Then number four, the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. He said, what's that, pastor? It's a big mouthful. <laughs> yes, yeah, it is. So what does it mean, I have been crucified with Christ? Apostle Paul had come to this part of his life where he recognized two things, according to these writings of Watch Many. That is, he come to the conclusion that his life is unworthy. His life cannot be repaired. His life is hopeless. 
He cannot overcome his sin. He cannot overcome his temper. He cannot overcome, his life cannot be renovated, if you like. His, his life cannot be improved. Why? God, when God sent Jesus to the cross, if not, he would not have sent Jesus. When God sent Jesus to the cross, God is saying, I can't change man. I can't change him. I can't remove his temper. No matter how much he tries, I can't remove the lust of the flesh, the lust of his eyes. I can't remove pride in the man. There is no hope for man. There is no hope for mankind. Therefore, I must allow my son Jesus to come on the cross. When he died on the cross, he took our place. And the Bible says he took us with him. That's what it means. I am crucified with Christ. It is embodied in this statement where a person comes to the understanding that I can't. I can't live my life as a Christian. How many of you think you can be a Christian? You can try to be a Christian? You try to be a... How many of you would like to be a good Christian? Ah, you see, you, we all think we want to be a Christian. We try to live a good Christian. The pastor tried to be a good pastor. You know? And you know you can't. It's impossible, the Bible says, for you to be a Christian. You can't. If you can be a Christian, if you can live a godly life, if you can live a holy life, Jesus don't need to die. And you don't need to be crucified with Jesus. When God looks at us, God says there is no hope. I can't change them. Their pride, their arrogance, their disobedience, their wavering heart, their insincerity, their impurity. How many of you think you are pure? You can't. If you truly understand the gospel, you will understand this very basic point. It's impossible to be a Christian, to live the Christian life. That's why you need to be crucified. The sooner you realize this, I can't overcome my temper. I can't overcome my sexual temptation. I can't overcome the flesh. I can't overcome my pride and arrogance. When somebody corrects me, I will react. I try to suppress it. I suppress my anger. You only suppress it, but it's still there in you. Hello? Take off the mask. We're teaching something very powerful and basic here. You can't. That is why many Christians become disillusioned and become disappointed. Hey, I thought I'm a Christian now. I've been a Christian five years. I, you know, the, the lust of the flesh and the temper, you suppress it. You suppress it very well. But once in a while, it comes out. And your balloon is burst. Yes or no? Yes or no? Don't act so innocent. You try to be loving, you try to be loving. You know what happened? The next thing, John, you are very proud that you are loving. You try to serve God in the church, you try to serve the church. Your pride spoils it. Hello? You can't please God. That's why when as far as God is concerned, you must be crucified. That's why Paul comes to the realization in Romans 6, he says, I am crucified with Christ. When Christ died, I died with him. I've died to sin. I cannot please God. Right? I cannot. I must come to the realization I cannot overcome my temper. As long as you think you can still try to manage your temper and control the temper, control your pride, try to be a good, humble Christian, you keep on trying. Until God allow you to keep trying, until you come to the point, Lord, I really can't. I give up trying. God says, good. Lesson one. Lesson 101. Number one, I can't. Yes? Now, how did you get born again? By faith. You believe that Jesus died on the cross. Yes or no? And by faith, you believe the gift of forgiveness and the gift of salvation. 
and you are saved. But the amazing thing about us is, after we are saved, we think that we can now try to live a holy life. We think that salvation is immediate, you believe by faith, you are saved. You believe the gospel, you are saved. Now I'm saved. Now you think that now I must try to please God. I must try to live the Christian life. I must try and endeavor to live a holy life. So you try. As long as you have this ambition in your heart to try to, God let you try. Sometimes He let you try for 20 years. Sometimes he let us try for 10 years. You try and see. You try to be humble and see, John. Try. One day I will provoke you and you lose your cool. Does this sound familiar? You can try. But so God allow you. God allow you to try. God allow you until you come to your senses and your realization. The man of God says, I can't. I cannot. Write this down. I cannot overcome my sin. I cannot live the Christian life. I cannot please God. And I will not try. That's the beginning of victory. When you come to realize that I cannot, and I will try not, I will not try, then what must you do, Pastor? We read that verse. Victory is a person. His name is Jesus. I have been crucified with Christ. It means I cannot. It's no longer I who live. That means I will not. But Christ who lives in me. I yield to him. Yes? So the key to experiencing the Christian victory is to quit trying, stop trying, recognize that you can't, and you will not, and you let Christ live in you. It's no longer I who live, but Christ now lives in. Hey, sometimes we don't see it. We, we read it a hundred times. It, don't, it doesn't strike us. It's no longer I who lives. Who lives? So how many people are living? One or two? According to this verse. Do, right? It's no longer I who live. Who, may, who, who can live? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That means there are two persons living. You have to decide who will live in your life. Whether you will live or Christ will live. So the man of God gave this illustration. Once upon a time in China, there were two families living under one house. And these two families have always trouble with each other, always quarreling, always having dispute. They live under one common house. They have two families. They never seem to be able to agree. And quite often, they go into violent disagreement and quarrel. What do you think is the solution? Huh? One family has to moved out. When that family moved out, there will be peace under heaven. Yes or no? Because the two families are fighting under the same house. How many people is living in your body? As long as you don't move out and let Christ move in, you will not be able to overcome. You will struggle. You will have the addiction. You will have the temptation. You will lose your temper. You will lose your cool. Why? Who is the prime minister of your life? You. Because you are your own prime minister. You are the boss. You are leading your life. And you can't. God already saw us. God did an evaluation of us, of humanity. That's why he sent his son Jesus. We are crucified with Christ. Our will, our ego, our pride, our self. We must believe that God sees no hope in us. There is no way to repair. 
cannot be repaired. You know, sometimes I got some device that is broken. I try to save money. I bring to the shop. The shop assistant tell me, Sir, this cannot be repaired. I try to persuade them. Can you check again? Maybe they can. Maybe you got a spare part. He told me, Sir, I told you cannot. This one all connected. You have to throw away this whole thing. I said, can't you open it and repair it? <laughs> said, you cannot repair this part. You have to change it. Oh, 300 ringgit to change. You know, some of my car parts. So when God look at us, the tila, you cannot be repaired. You are beyond repair. That's what the cross means. That's what it means to be a Christian. When God sees us, no, you can't try to be goody-goody. You can't try to please God. You can try all you want, but then after a while, you'll be proud. You try to suppress your, 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 your lust. You try to suppress your addiction. Then it surfaces again. You suppress, you succeed in three months, six months, it comes up again. Yes or no? You try to practice, just smile. People scold you, just smile. Just walk away. You succeed in third time, fourth time. Fifth time, you blow your top. So I cannot and I will not. It's no longer I who live. But Christ now lives in me. So I got to move now. I got to abdicate the throne of my life. This throne here. I got to exit, so to speak. Figuratively speaking. And let Christ. So God sent his son. When you receive Christ, you receive his spirit. He comes and lives in you. And you say, Lord, it's no longer I. You take over. Lord, I can't handle this situation. You take over. Lord, this is too big for me. You take over. And Lord, you know my temper. You know my weakness. You know my roving eyes. You know how my weakness with money. God, I can't handle it. Jesus, would you come and take over? The life I now live, I live by Faith in who? The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This faith in the Son of God is you see, though he's invisible, but I want you to know he's real. He's alive. Paul has come to the stage in his life, he realized that I cannot and I will not try and I will not live my life. The life I now live, how do I live this life? I constantly have faith. Faith is the key. Faith in who? The Son of God. Not faith in myself. Not faith in my willpower. Faith in my education. Faith in my knowledge. Uh, you know, th th those things can be a blessing. But when you talk about fighting temptation and lust, Fighting addictions of the flesh, controlling your temper and your negative emotion. Many people have allowed negative emotion to destroy them. They can't handle it. Something bad happened. They remember many years and it eats them up. Yes or no? You can't handle it. God already saw it. That's why he sent Jesus. So he says, the life that I now live, I live by faith. In who? The Son of God. You can have faith in this Son of God because He loves you. The scripture says, He loved you and gave His life for you. Listen, if you and I come back to this basic fundamental Christianity, is to be conscious, be Christ conscious, that in your life is revolved, you're living in the realm, that you always have faith in Christ, the person. Always have the Son of God before you, living in you, trusting Him, looking to Him in every situation. The life that I now live, I live how? By faith in the Son of God. What does it mean to live by faith in the Son of God? Everything that God said about Jesus, do you believe? Everything God said He has given Jesus to Jesus can be yours if you believe. Jesus said, the things and the works that I do, you can do also. 
that gave me faith and courage to be a pastor. He says, the things that I do to heal the sick, to do miracles, to, 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 to minister to the poor, the things that I do, you can do also. As he was, so will you be. Hallelujah. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth who went about doing good and healing all those who were sick. So, to live by faith in the Son of God, it means I begin to believe the words in the Bible, what God said about Christ, the person. And I believe, I choose to believe what God said about Christ and what God said about me can be mine. It is mine for the taking. What does the Bible say? He says, thanks be unto God who always causes you to have victory. God gave you victory. If you begin to believe that and by faith live in that, Jesus comes and manifests. Jesus comes and make it real to you. Hallelujah. When you come to the point, say, God, I can't handle this temptation. I always blow up. Lord, I can't, and I cannot, and also I will not try. Lord, I surrender to you, Jesus. You know, there was a drug addict who worked for Benny Hinn. I heard this testimony. He says, God, I love this heroin stuff. God, if you don't take this away from me, I'm going to die. How many of you know that if you are honest with God, God will do something for you? When you say, God, I can't handle this. Jesus, the life I now live, I live by faith in you. Not in myself, but in you, the Son of God. And I know I can trust you because the Bible says you love me and gave yourself for me. So moment by moment, day by day, as you surrender that struggle, as you surrender that temptation, that weakness that you have to Him, and you let Jesus take over, you step aside and you take over. Jesus comes to manifest. He will manifest His power. Suddenly you find, hey, why am I not angry? Why the temper is gone? Why that? That, that the struggle is not there. Why the temptation seems very, very, very attractive. Now it doesn't seem that attractive anymore. Why? Because Jesus has come into the scene. Hallelujah. He is now living inside of you. You are no longer living. You're no longer in control. You have given up control to Him. And He comes and He takes over. And He, he calms your emotions. He does a miracle for you. Glory to God. The key is faith. Living by faith in who? The Son of God. This is moment by moment, day by day, situation by situation, temptation by temptation, sin by sin. And you find that Jesus comes and gives you that victory. Hallelujah. He is the only way. So the man of God I will give a summary here today. He described this nature of life that win is, see the next slide, he gives us victory, 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Thanks be to God who gives us the... Now, how does this victory come? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory is not independent of Him. You cannot try with your own struggle to overcome your sin or your temper or your weakness. It is the person of Christ. So there is a need today in the church not to sweep the sins over the carpet or underneath the carpet, but to confront your own sin one by one. Confront your own weakness and temptation and allow Jesus to take over. Like the two families, let one family move out. There can only be one family in the house. There can only be one master over your life. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. Say amen. Not you. 
So five things about this new life that he wants to give us when Christ comes into our life. Number one, it is a life exchange. It is not a life changed. So what is the difference? See, the Bible always teaches that when you accept Christ, He gives you a new life. It's not renovating or repairing your old life. It is a totally brand new life. When you become a Christian, when you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I open my heart to you. I cannot and I will not try. I need you. Come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. What happens? It is not change. It's not a life change. It's not a life repair, but it's a totally new life from heaven. The Holy Spirit is from where? Out of this world. Say amen. The Holy Spirit is out of this world. He is from heaven. So when He comes into your life, it is a life exchange. I give you beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. There is an exchange. You rise up from your ashes, your broken life, your brokenness, your despair, your sorrow, your sickness. It is a life exchange with God. Say, God, this is my life, broken. Pick up from the miry clay. It is a life exchange. When this life is given to him, he gives you a new life. It is not he trying to repair your life, you know. Your life is broken here, let me repair a bit. Here, a bit crooked, let me... Massage this bone. Let me fix this part. Let me. It is a new life. At an instant, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. He puts in you a new heart and a new spirit. Hallelujah. Your body may remain old, but your inner life, your spirit is new. It is exchanged. Hallelujah. So learn one secret here. How to be a, a successful believer is whenever you have struggled, say, Lord, I give you my temper. Lord, I give you this temptation. And Lord, unless you do something, I'm going to fall. Say, Amen. You quit struggling, quit trying, quit trying to suppress your temper. Say, God, I can't do it. Here am I, Lord. You find that His power comes to you. You find that, hey, it's gone. Jesus, take over. Jesus, rise up in me. And be strong on the inside. When you have fear, you say, Lord, I exchange my fear for your faith. I, I exchange my despair for hope. Hallelujah. I, explain, I exchange my discouragement for your courage. Our walk with God is always an exchange. Say amen. He exchanged things with you. Give him what you have. And let him give you. Give him your sorrow. He will replace you with joy. Give him your hopelessness. He will give you hope and direction. Give him your fear. He will replace it with faith. Don't hold on to your sorrow. Don't hold on to your fear. Don't hold on to your despair. Don't hold on to your disappointment and try to renovate your life. Read some self-improvement book. You try to renovate. Try to improve. You can try but you still find elements of it still present. But we have seen over the years as a Christian, me as a Christian pastor, people who just give their lives, God, I'm broken. Here am I, Lord. And we see the lives change. Amazing change. It's a miracle. The new life, the life that we win is a life exchange. I'm reminded of a politician many years I met in Klang. He was a politician. He then became a Christian. He accepted Jesus Christ. And this was his words of his testimony. He was sharing in the full gospel meeting. I was in that meeting. He says, you know, in, 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 in the past, when people say something against me, I will hit back. I'll never give chance. That's the way politicians work. When somebody says something, when I heard it, when I hear it, I don't like it, I will start flipping my calling cards, you know. Those days, they have these boxes of calling cards. Now you have it on your phone. So I will flip and see who I can call, which minister I will call, which department head I will call. And I will hit back. I will call the press. And you know, 
But he said, since now I became a Christian, after I became a Christian, after six months, after two years now coming to the church and worshiping God, I don't know why when I worship God, I cry. I don't know why I feel something in my heart. And one day, some politician said something about me and I heard it. To my amazement, I did not react. It's no more there. In the past, I would have tried to call some political person, minister to, to, to do something, you know, to my enemy. But I just didn't have that feeling anymore. What happened to him? It is a life exchange. Glory to God. God doesn't renovate your life. He gives you a new life. Number two, the life that wins is a life that is obtained and not attained. I hope this is good news for you. The word attain means is something progressive. You try and you struggle and you struggle to try to be like Christ. You try to be like the pastor. You try to be a good Christian. You try, you try. So there is attainment or achievement. But the life that wins, the life that is full of joy, the life that is full of peace and full of rest and satisfaction is not by trying, by attainment, but is by obtaining. How do you obtain this life, Pastor? By faith. If you believe, you will receive. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, and if you confess your sin, your sins will be forgiven. If you believe that, when you confess your sin, you felt the whole burden lifted up from you. Yes or no? You receive that forgiveness instantly by faith. After you have been forgiven, the Bible promises many things, many things in your life. Yes, the things that I do, you shall do also. The same anointing that is upon Jesus can come upon you. Sometimes we think we have to attain to these things, you know. We have to do something, we have to pray so hard, we have to struggle to attain. After receiving salvation by faith, we think we will now grow our sanctification by attaining, by achieving progressively. You think you have to attain to a certain level to control your temper. Watch many says no. He says the moment you surrender to Christ, He takes over. You find that it's gone. We say, Pastor, after it's gone, he come back all. Oh. Ah, okay, we look at it next lesson. Why? Because there's something more, some step lacking. But it starts with this. I cannot and I will not try. All I have to do is move out of the house. Let him take over. Then you'll find that he can fix that situation for you. You can take that over. But to sustain that, there is another step. What is that? You must continue to believe. The life that I now live, I live by faith. Who? In who? In the Son of God. You have to live in the realm of faith. You have to live according to His word. You believe His words. The more you believe His words, the more the truth manifests. That's all you have to do. The life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So number one, the life that we is a life exchange, not change. The life that we is a life that is obtained, not attained. Attained, brother John, is your own effort. You try to attain the anointing. You try to get the anointing. You try to attain the gifts of the Spirit. You try to acquire the ministry gifts. You try to attain it. It's your own struggle. And you find that you, the more you struggle, the more the power doesn't flow. Say amen. But when by faith you believe, you receive, it is yours. It is a gift. Number three, the life that wins is a life that is a gift. It's not a reward. We grow up in a system of rewards and meritocracy in the school, in the college, in our working place. We always have to earn to get something. Yes or no? Huh? The, the, the father will tell the son, Johnny, if you do well, you get three A's, five, four A's, I will buy you a bicycle. It's based on merit. You go to college, you have to earn 
your place in the class. Then when you go into the university and pass off from the university, then you work in the working world, you also have to prove to your boss. It's always based on merit. You have to do something. You have to acquire, you have to put in strength and effort to get something. We grow up in this world, whether we realize it or not, and it's so ingrained in our mindset that you have to earn something. You have to do something to earn something. Yes? So when you come to God, we have this mindset. We think we have to attain it. We think we have to earn it. You have to earn God's love. You think that your behavior is good, God loves you more. You think you come to church early, of course it's good to come to church early, I think today God loves me more. Lah. So it's always based on reward. I give some money in the offering bag, ah, see God loves me. You know? So we think like that. But you realize that in the kingdom of God, in God's way, it is always a gift. By faith. By faith, we receive. How is it some people have more from God and some people seem to have less? Huh? John? Why you see some ministers that have more power? Why they have more things compared to some? Why some Christians seem to be more blessed? I'm not just talking about financial, but spiritually. Why they seem to have more revelation? They seem to have more joy. They seem to have more faith. They seem to have more courage. You know? It's because they believe more. It's by faith. They receive. The Christian life is a life that you receive by gift. It's not by works, say amen. The more you believe the words of the Bible, the more you believe the words of Jesus, you begin to experience His promises. Number four. The life that win is a life expressed, not a life suppressed. Say, so what do you mean, pastor? Life suppressed. All your life, you're suppressing your temper. Mm. All the life, you're trying to suppress your temptation. You're suppressing the lust of the flesh. You're suppressing, suppressing. Do you know there are some people who cannot laugh? They don't know how to laugh. There is no joy. Why? Because they suppress too much. Everything they try to control. And you look at them, their faces are very sad. But someone who, who is been set free from the Lord, he can cry, he can laugh, he can worship, he can jump. Say amen. There's a place to laugh, there's a place to jump, there's a time to cry. You, it is a life expressed. What are you expressing, pastor? You're expressing the life of God. Do you know the Holy Spirit has personality? You can prophesy. Just now when we prophesy, the Spirit of God will come upon you. It is a life that is expressing all the time. You express the personality of God. You express the life of God. You express the personality of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has personality. Sometimes He wants to pray. Sometimes He wants to prophesy. Sometimes He wants to sing. Didn't you see the expression of the Holy Spirit just now when this group of people were worshipping God? You thought it was their talent. I'm here to tell you it's not their talent. It's the expression of the personality of the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Are you getting what I'm saying? They are expressing through a vessel, through a human body, the Holy Spirit has personality. Paul says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Yes? That means he wants to come out. Don't quench. What does it mean, don't quench? A little boy wants to, always got question, you know. Mommy, why, why like that? Daddy, why like that? Teacher, teacher, why like that? Why? Because they have personality. They want to express themselves. You worry if the child sits there and you tell, sit here, don't move until I come back from marketing. And he sits there for six hours and he didn't, really didn't move. Uh, then you worry about your son. Correct or not? A healthy child would have expression of personality. And so a healthy Christian should have expression of God's personality. Say amen. Huh? You worry if your child sits here for six hours and don't move. 
Say, don't move, Johnny, until I tell you. <laughs> and Johnny doesn't move for four hours, six hours. You are doing all your household in the kitchen. You will worry about this child because he has no personality and you worry for him. A healthy child will not be able to sit six hours. He wants to express himself, constantly asking questions, constantly raising his hand, doing something, climbing on the chair, maybe, you know, making sounds of a bird, etc. Hey, there are some Christians who have no expression. When I say no expression, I don't mean physical expression. They have no spiritual expression. They can't sing, they won't worship God, they cannot cry, they cannot pray. They cannot prophesy. The word of God is not flowing out from their lives. The life that wins is a life that has expression. It's a life expressed and not a life suppressed. If the Holy Spirit is truly alive in your life, there will be movement, there will be expression. If the child is healthy, there will be expression. Say Amen. How do you know a Christian is alive? When I say alive, I mean really in vibrant relationship with God. There is expression. Whenever the Holy Spirit is present, there is movement. Remember, the Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the earth. You remember that verse? And the earth was dark and void, but the Spirit of God Move. If you know the Holy Spirit, if He's in your life, there will always be movement. There will always be changes. There will always be movement. There will always be expression in the things of God. Amen. If you ask somebody, how's your Christian life? You know what I say. Same la. How's your life today? Nothing, nothing going. Same la. Nothing exciting. Why? No expression. No joy. No change. You are not as healthy as you think you are. If God is alive in you, you cannot be quiet. You cannot be... I mean, I don't mean that you have to talk all the time. But there will be expression of God. Say Amen. Not suppression. God, Jesus says, when I come to your life, I give you life and life more Abundantly. An abundant life is an expressive life. Come on. Come on, shake it. You must be somebody who must know how to cry. Who can cry, who can laugh, who can jump. There is freedom. When Jesus sets you free, you will be free indeed. Hallelujah. Now turn to your neighbor and say, that's me. I have expression. Number five, the life that wins is a miracle. Possessing this life is a miracle. For the politician to tell me, you know, I used to do this, but now I don't feel like doing it anymore. What happened? Did anybody do surgery on him? No. There is a change in his life. The things you love before, you don't love anymore. The things that you don't love, like goodness, kindness, good works, you start to love. The things that you love, the darkness, now you hate. Did you go through an education? Did you go through brainstorming? Did you go through brainwashing? No. Something happened in the inside of you. Say amen. Your wife changed, your husband changed, and you wonder why. Must be the pastor. It's not the pastor. The pastor merely preached the word. It's the work of God. It's the Holy Spirit in your life. He gives you a new life. It's a life exchange. Come on, somebody learn to exchange things with God. Is there something in your life you don't like? Is there sorrow? Give him that sorrow and let him give you a new joy. If there's failure, Hey, it's not a failure. Give him that failure. If it's that disappointment, give him that disappointment. Say amen. Let him give you hope. Let him give you new opportunities, new relationships, new vision, 
new plans, new purpose in your life. Glory to God. See, exciting to work with God. Exciting to live with God. You lost a good friend. You lost a good friendship. Give that disappointment to God. Yes? Some of you have a loved one. You lost a loved one. You felt, oh God, I will never be able to have this loved one replaced in my life. I'm here to tell you, you are wrong. God can create new things for you. He can give you new friends. He can give you new friendship. He can create new relationships. He can give you new ministries. He can give you new business opportunities. Hallelujah. He can give you new families. You lost your natural family. God can give you spiritual families that will be closer. You never dream possible than your own natural family. Say amen. Come on, learn to live a life exchange. Always learn to exchange things with God. Say, God, I give you my weakness. God, I give you my, all my limitation. I give you all my sin. I give you all my failures. I give you all my ugliness for the beauty of your holiness. Sometimes people say, oh, why this man always looks so good one? Why this Christian always looks so good and, you know, so holy, so full of the Lord? Maybe he learned more to give more and exchange more with God. Say, God, I give you my ugliness. Is there anyone here you don't see your own ugliness? So if you see your ugliness, don't hide it. Don't, don't, don't sweep it underneath the carpet. Say, God, I give you my ugliness. That was ugly of me. That was arrogant of me. God, I give you my pride. Yes? God, give me your beauty. Give me the oil of joy for my sorrow. Give me the garment of praise. I, I'm discouraged. I have the spirit of heaviness. I have this burden. Give it to him. Exchange. Not change. Say amen. You are, many people are waiting for God to come. God, change me. Change my heart. Change me. Change me. You know, God says, I can't change you. You're beyond repair. Yes, that's the truth. That's why God has to send Jesus. And he says he crucified you with Jesus. If you are good enough, you can try to be good enough. He don't have to crucify you. Oh, see, we didn't get this revelation as a Christian for many years. We thought God only crucified Christ. But no, the Bible says he crucified Christ. He crucified me with Christ. Beyond repair, no use. Sir, this part cannot be changed. You have to buy a new part. So if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. You see, we, we know this, we are new creation as after born again. But after we born again, we think we, now we know we are new creation, we think we have to achieve our sanctification. We think we have to achieve our holiness. We think we have to achieve all this. No, no, no. It's also a gift. The scripture says what? Don't you know Christ has been made unto you wisdom, sanctification, and redemption? Now, we all believe Christ has been made for us for redemption. We pick the third word. But the first two words, we think we have to achieve it ourselves. Christ has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Oh, we all be pick redemption only. See, I'm in Christ, I have redemption. But when it comes to sanctification, wisdom, you say, let me grow slowly, huh? Let me achieve. Let me try to attain, read more Bible. Yeah, but this is good to read more Bible. But you see, when you have to come to realize that it's not by your doing, but when you come to the person of Christ, you know, He said, Lord, you are my wisdom. I give you my limitation for your wisdom. You'll be amazed that God gives you the wisdom that will shock you. Suddenly, you realize, oh, I see the light. How many of you know people say, I see the light. Ah, now I understand. I see the light. So for many years, you don't see the light about the issues of this life, 
about your marriage, about your business, about your children, about whatever issues of life. You don't see the light. But if you make Jesus your wisdom, say, Jesus, you are my wisdom. The faith I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Lord, you are my wisdom. My wisdom does not come by education alone, by Bible knowledge alone. I can have all the Bible knowledge, but I may not have wisdom. The Pharisees have all the Bible knowledge, but they have no wisdom. But when you make Jesus your wisdom, suddenly you say, I see. Ah, ha ha, that's how I should live. Ha ha, that's what I should do. Ha ha, that's how I should handle this situation. I see the light. Where does this come from? Spirit of God, when you make Him your wisdom, it's a gift. Say Amen. It's not by your struggle. You try and struggle. And you try to be sanctified, you know. You try to sanctify yourself. You sanctify. You, you, it's become such a burden. The man of God says, receive it by faith. When you, you cross the threshold and you walk into victory, victory lies in the person of Jesus Christ. Learn to exchange with Him. Make Him, be conscious of Him. Have, have Christ consciousness in your life. And you find that you will change. Say Amen. Sometimes people ask me, Pastor, where you get all this teaching? Where you get all these messages? Where you get all this revelation? I have no idea. It comes from Him. Of course, some I read, some I study. But for God to make it real, and applicable and relevant to our lives, it's Him. Say Amen. I hope this message helps you and free you from your struggle. I cannot control my temper. I will not try. So what must I do, Pastor? Just come and exchange it with Him. Try it and you will see. Yes, Amen. You find that it disappears. It, it, it kind of evaporates. The temptation loses its power because Jesus is there. This also applies even to casting of demons. There was one time I read a book by Derek Prince. He was saying, you know, when they cast out demons, he says, uh, he stepped aside and he let Jesus do it. Sometimes when we cast out demons, we think it's we. Ah, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, come out! No. But the demon is still not coming out. And the demon is laughing back, ah, you can't cast me out. So there was one time, there was one girl, not, of this, not in this church, many years ago, we tried to cast the demon out. And I was young then, we tried to cast, and the demon was making fun of us. You can't cast me, I was mocking us. You know, I was using my strength, my voice and everything, using the name of Jesus. The demon was just lock, mocking us. Then I remember what I read by this man of God. He says, just let Jesus take over. So what I did was, I stood there and I saw the, the women there. And then I said, wonderful Jesus, I step aside and I let you take over. I deliberately walked back a few steps. I said, Jesus, I let you take over. Suddenly, there was a fear that came upon the face of the demon and the woman. She changed her countenance. There was a, there was a, there were moments of just quietness. There was like, you could see there was a change in her face. When I said, Lord, you take over. If you believe, and if I believe that Jesus comes and take over, he does the fighting for you. Say Amen even over evil spirits. So Jesus can do the fighting for you in your heart over the temptation, that lust, the habit, that weakness, whatever it is. Exchange it with Him. It's not by struggle. Learn to say like Apostle Paul and the man of God, I cannot and I will not. So what must I do? I will yield and surrender. And let Jesus, you take over. I let you say, Lord, it's too big for me. I can't handle it. Lord, you handle it for me. I truly mean it. I move thou, Lord. I let you take over. 
my life. Say amen. That's what it means to be a Christian, to let Christ live. Apostle Paul came to this level. He says, it's no longer I who live. It's no longer me. I cannot and I will not. But Christ now lives in me. Constantly, hour by hour, day by day, temptation by temptation. The next time you face the temptation, the next time you face the struggle, say, Lord, just close your eyes and whisper, Lord, take over. You see what happened. A new strength comes inside of you. Jesus will manifest for you. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet. We must close now.